Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening for our guests from overseas. It's a delight to be back with you. This is the first instep of 2021. Last year was great. Uh, and I'm looking forward to today's event as well as the upcoming events. We're going to have a very robust schedule. I am delighted that we have such a large crowd for today's session. I think it both speaks to the importance of the transatlantic relationship, the relationship between Europe, the United States and Europe, but it also speaks to the three guests that I have here today joining me and also joining us uh, is Marjorie Chorlins, who is the Senior Vice President for Europe. She'll join the session later. Let me uh, just say at the outset that I am very pleased uh, that the three ambassadors that I'm going to introduce have joined us, each of them in their own right, have had extremely distinguished careers and offer a perspective, not just on the transatlantic relationship, but on all the global challenges of the day based on their experience, their deep experience in diplomacy, in politics, in other venues. They really have a lot to offer today on a range of topics that we'll get through. I will say at the outset that three of the last four people I in interviewed for INSTEP are now in the Obama, I'm sorry, in President Biden's cabinet. Uh, I can assure you that our three guests today have no aspirations to be uh, in the Biden cabinet. They're serving their governments quite well. Uh, let me begin with introducing them all and then framing today's conversation. I begin with Ambassador Philip Etienne, who has had a storied career as a diplomat, served as ambassador to the EU and to Germany, among other posts. He's passionate about science and math, but before you call him a nerdy diplomat, just remember he is also an avid hiker and someone I think is also fine uh, taste in his choice of wines based on my personal experience. Very close to President Macron, serving as a diplomatic advisor and Sherpa before coming to the District of Columbia to serve as ambassador to, uh, ambassador to United States for France in 2019. Next up is Ambassador uh, Emily Haber, who is also someone who knows Washington well. Her father actually was a DCM of the embassy in, in Washington for uh, Germany. Uh, however, she has succeeded her father in a sense that she is now the ambassador here. She spent her early years in and obviously in Washington, she's been posted in Moscow. She'll have some views to offer about Russia. Uh, she's been a state secretary in charge of Homeland Security and migration policy uh, during the height of Europe's uh, migration challenges. She's a historian by nature, uh, but she is someone who brings a great deal of present experience as well. Last but not least is Ambassador Stavros Labernidis from the EU delegation. Uh, unlike the previous two, he didn't really start as a diplomat. He was a trade lawyer, as, as was I, at Wilmer and Cutler in the early 1990s. He cut his teeth on politics only after serving in the Greek army, which was a mandatory stint. He served as Greek's Minister of Foreign Affairs, VP in, in the European Parliament. Uh, so he's had a lot of posts, including uh, looking over the EU's human rights uh, endeavors. Uh, he is an avid art collector, or maybe he would say because his walls and his embassy were clear, he had to put art on his walls. But if you ever get invited to his embassy, the EU embassy, you would find very distinctive pieces of art. Maybe he'll reference that. The morning session today is off record. Uh, sorry, is on record, is on record today. And uh, if you have questions, please uh, bring them to the Microsoft Teams uh, chat function and we hope to have time to include your questions. Let me set the stage about today's conversation. The transatlantic relationship isn't just a commercial relationship, as we know, it's a strategic relationship in every sense of the world. Yes, it's a big commercial relationship. There's one trillion in two-way trade. There's 4.5 trillion in two-way investment. There are millions of jobs, uh, 16 million jobs tied to uh, the relationship and worth one third of the global GDP. But the relationship's much more than just about numbers. In fact, it's about shared values. It's about a shared commitment to dealing with global challenges. Uh, and it's no question a relationship that's been challenged over the last several years. Some would say 
it's frayed, it's been strained, it's time to re-energize this relationship. On the one side, in the last few years, we've had the American first strategy, and on the other side, an open debate in Europe about strategic autonomy, which leaves a lot of people asking, what does that mean? We'll hear answers to that today. Uh, President uh, Biden clearly has affirmed the importance of reaching out to allies in Europe as a key priority when dealing with the pandemic, dealing with climate issues, dealing with other issues we'll get to today. I know National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who also has participated in STEP forums, has talked about reaching out to European leaders as well and did so, I think, in late in just a week ago. The European Commission has put forward a transatlantic agenda. We think that's a very positive first step. Uh, there is no question that transforming aspirations of a stronger alliance between Europe and the United States is a goal that will require long term uh, look at some of the critical challenges that we face together and short term reality check about the issues we have to address immediately. Certainly at the top of the list is, as I said, the global pandemic. It's not a European pandemic. It's not a U.S. pandemic. It's a global pandemic. Climate issues that are important to the Europeans and, of course, to the incoming administration, to President Biden's administration. And we have to worry about the rise of extremism and populism and other issues that are going to affect future generations. It's imperative we get this relationship right. It's imperative it gets off to a good start during the, this next chapter, this next era. So let me get into the areas of questions. Let me start with the pandemic response and recovery, uh, not just because the pandemic is front and center to all of us, but we cannot restore the global economy without Europe and the United States playing a critical role when it comes to vaccines. We've had issues rolling out the vaccines, but both Europe and the United States have a huge responsibility working with the private sector to make sure vaccines are distributed both in Europe and the United States, but also globally. There is obviously temptation to focus towards our own personal domestic needs. Uh, President von der Leyen has called for a stronger European health union, but we can't lose sight, as I said, of the global picture. So let me start with Stavros uh, and ask you, are we doing enough to encourage a collaborative effort between the United States and the EU on vaccine distribution, on managing travel uh, bans, and other measures to ensure we have shared agenda when it comes to managing the pandemic and, of course, the economic challenges that we both face? Stavos, your thoughts? Thank, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Myron. I would say, um, uh, if you look at the private sector, uh, we, they, they didn't need any one of us to tell them how to do it. Uh, Pfizer, an American company, BioNTech, a German company, um, worked together and came out with the first supremely effective uh, vaccine. Uh, and I think that that is in itself a message of how the openness of the EU market and the US market has allowed for such collaborations in virtually everything. And the 16 million jobs, therefore, that you mentioned to come to come about. This is the biggest relationship we have. So when it also comes to economic recovery, there's no question that we are focusing very closely on the U.S. recovery. The faster you recover, the better it is for our economy and our workers. And the faster we recover, the better it is for your economies and your workers. The second point I would I would make on the vaccines, uh, Myron, is that uh, we absolutely have a, um, uh, a strategy in the EU, the EU vaccine strategy, um, after the pandemic, we realized that working together and showing solidarity to each other was the most the important, the only way to beat this. Uh, and in nine months, we've managed to uh, uh, to buy more than two billion vaccines because of that uh, strategy, which we not only are distributing now uh, to our own citizens, but also around the world. And that's the third point. The EU and the US have to work together on the most important challenge, which is not just to vaccinate our own people but to make sure that the world knows that we're not being selfish in doing so. Uh, there are many countries out there that are very poor, people that are poor with no uh, health infrastructure. Uh, their jobs are being lost with no real prospect of getting them back. These people need to be vaccinated. Uh, solidarity here is not charity. We're not just doing this uh, because, um, you know, it's a nice thing to do. Uh, this is a global problem. And unless we face it globally, uh, it will be coming back to bite us no matter what we do internally. Uh, which is why also I am supremely pleased, I have to tell you, that the United States uh, under the President Biden 
uh, returned to the WHO, uh, joined the callback facility, all those things that are necessary. Fourth point I want to make, Myron, here, and it's important. Vaccines will not save us. Uh, vaccinations will. And getting people to vaccinate is a, a joint challenge that we face, not perhaps initially, uh, because we have more supply than uh, than the people we can even, uh, you know, uh, uh, vaccinate immediately. But this has to happen real fast. And uh, and uh, we are doing this uh, uh, real fast. But we need to convince people, Americans and Europeans, that they have to take the vaccination. That's a, that's a hill to climb. Final point, supply chains. We realized during COVID uh, that we were too reliant on, uh, on a very small number of other countries, uh, China, India, others, on fundamental uh, medicines or supply uh, uh, or uh, PPE equipment. Uh, the challenge now will be to, uh, to build a supply chain that are resilient and are more diversified, but not to shut our economies to assume that we can produce everything internally ourselves. This cannot happen, should not happen. It makes no economic sense uh, as well. But if you think at, uh, at the joint interests uh, that we share, the, the economies that we share, the values that we share, uh, transatlantic supply chains uh, should certainly be um, fortified, and that's something that we're working with the administration every day to achieve. Stavros, I want to stay on you for a follow-up question. Uh, I think you made some very important points about vaccines. You made some very important points about the supply chains and mitigating the risk of government mandates. But I want to ask you about macroeconomic coordination. Obviously, this is a area that's the, going to be the focus of the finance ministers, certainly Janet Yellen, yeah, the new Secretary of Treasury, and others will be coordinating very closely with the Europeans, both directly and through, obviously, the G20 context. But what steps should we be taking, Europe and the United States, to be worried about the rest of the world that's going to be quite fragile in its recovery? Frankly, Europe is, is going to be sluggish in its recovery. In the United States, while we expect a, a rebound in the second half of this year, it's going to be more like a case recovery, so we have issues ourselves as well. Any thoughts about the, the economic piece of this? Yeah, there's no question that we have to spend, governments have to spend now and they have to spend big. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that, that does create uh, uh, effects uh, in the future for issues such as debt, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we did in Europe uh, very early on in this, uh, this uh, uh, anti-COVID campaign is to, is to uh, uh, create a fund, a special fund uh, of about 750 billion, almost a trillion dollars. Uh, that we are borrowing money collectively as Europeans together in order to be able to, uh, in order to, be able to um, uh, give then, not to everyone equally, but to those European member states that are most hit. This was a, a paradigm change from, uh, from what we were doing back uh, during the financial crisis. It was not easy, but it was the kind of um, example, uh, once again, that Europe during the biggest crisis uh, manages not just to find a way to, uh, you know, trot along, uh, but to in fact make itself stronger uh, and more united. Uh, this money will start unrolling soon and uh, it's going to be supporting the weakest economies. We're doing this uh, because it's important to bring back the European single market at a level playing field. Uh, this is the crown jewel of the European integration, the single market, as you know, this is what gets uh, you know, uh, trillions of uh, U.S. investment coming into Europe, uh, U.S. Uh, companies and workers, uh, you know, every year voting with their feet and coming to the biggest open market in the world, the single market. We have to protect it uh, and we are doing it. And in the process, we're also showing solidarity to those most hard hit. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I think that we also expect in, on the U.S. side. And let me also say we are looking at the recovery moving way beyond going back to business as usual. Green recovery for us, the emphasis on uh, boosting our growth through uh, climate uh, transition technologies, digital recovery. Uh, those are huge areas of cooperation with the new administration. Uh, if we work together on some of these challenges, we're going to move much faster to our climate ambitions, uh, to our digital ambitions. Uh, digital ambitions also means making sure that we set the standards for AI, and other stuff that uh, that unfortunately some more authoritarian countries around the world are trying to set for us. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it never ends. Uh, but uh, this is one of the most uh, difficult and one of the most hopeful periods uh, for transatlantic cooperation. Well, Stavos, thank you. We're going to get into the areas that you talked about at the end there on climate and digital in more detail. But I want to switch to Philippe and talk about uh, 
you know, we have the pandemic before us, but we have other challenges as well. Uh, one of the concerns that a lot of us have is rising populism and extremism. We saw a good example of that in the United States on January 6th, a real test to the democracy in our country. Uh, and certainly it was a painful experience for those of us living in Washington and around this country. But it also was something watched very closely by our friends in Europe and others around the world. But I, I would argue that Europe has seen its own share of, of populism and extremist uh, efforts and its frustration maybe in part over economic inequality. There may be a number of factors really that is driving this nationalism versus globalism, uh, questions about government's role in society. And I wanna ask you, because President Macron has been pretty clear about this is a critical moment in time. He's talked about it in quotes, a break point in terms of the capitalist system uh, and with, that we need to reinvent the forms of international cooperation. Uh, Philippe, what does he mean by that? And what's your view about sort of the rising tide of populism here in Europe and elsewhere? Philippe, thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you, Myron. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having me together with my two colleagues and friends, uh, Emily and Stavros. It means a lot of me. Uh, it means a lot for me. And uh, uh, it means that we, the Europeans, we, especially now with this new administration, we want to, to develop our cooperation and to tackle together the, the global challenges. On the 6th of January, uh, we were all obviously um, together with our, our American friends and with uh, um, this uh, challenge to our democracy. And we we have admired, I think, very much how the American, the great American democracy proved its its resilience. Um, but you're right, Myron, this is a, a challenge we face also in our um, in our countries. It's a common challenge. We have internal and external challenges. Uh, to our democracies and we must uh, reflect on this. Uh, you have mentioned a lot of aspects uh, in this uh, in this field. I, I cannot cover all of them, but uh, uh, I remember uh, as a G7 Sherpa uh, uh, when France had the, the presidency of G7 in, in 2019, how we put the fight against inequalities uh, uh, the fight for equal opportunities in access to education, to health, and to, to many other uh, basic features of our daily life. We put this fight against inequalities at the core of our presidency. And I think it's uh, it's very important to, to, to look at this uh, as uh, something we have to do also to resist uh, populist uh, um, forces or impulses in, in our political systems, in, in, in our populations. And in this respect, uh, the private economy, uh, uh, the business sector has, has also a responsibility. You see more and more uh, positions taken uh, by the private sector, and you know this better than I do in the US chamber. Um, you see more and more development in the uh, so-called ESG uh, standards uh, for more um, responsible behavior, both uh, um, on on the economy and on on, on social, uh, uh, on climate and sustainability, uh, and on governance issues. And this is good because um, I think uh, our Capitalism uh, it needs also to adapt to these challenges. And uh, uh, during our G7 presidency, we, we have uh, encouraged the creation of a business coalition for inclusive growth. This is a basic uh, goal. The growth, or uh, in, in, in the case of uh, our moment today, the, the fight against uh, the virus and for economic recovery, it must be inclusive. It must uh, also um, um, uh, tackle the inequalities I mentioned. And we have to learn from this. It is not only about the present moment. It is not only about implementing everything Stavros has said, which the EU as such uh, has uh, succeeded in developing. It's also after this battle, when we have won this battle, about drawing the consequences for our own societies. 
Well, Emily, you might want to pick up on what Philip said on, on the issue of populism and rising sense of inequality and the role of the private sector to work with governments. But I have to frame it in the context, Emily, of a recent poll in your country that showed that 53% of Germans after Trump are really questioning uh, whether America can be trusted any, any further. 71% say the American political system is broken. Now, obviously, in the context of the importance of transatlantic relations, that strong a view in Germany is concerning. Now, a poll can be changed in six months, but the framework is around this rising tide of uh, challenges that we face together. And obviously, January 6th contributed to some of the polling in, in Germany. But how do you look at the issue of populism and the framework of where we are today with the United States relationship with Europe and Germany in particular? Emily? Thank you, uh, Myron. And let me join my colleagues in, in uh, uh, saying thank you to you, uh, to you for placing the transatlantic relationship on the agenda of uh, 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 this instep meeting of the uh, chamber. Um, let me turn to your question. Um, as many, many Americans, uh, I was uh, shocked and devastated uh, on the uh, 6th of November. First, when I saw the breach of security uh, um, in the first branch of government, uh, and then when we saw events unfolding, uh, which were clearly, as Americans say, an attack on democracy and an attack on the guardrails of democracy. At the end of the day, though, the capital was cleared, uh, the uh, uh, procedures were resumed, uh, and democracy had prevailed. And I think that will remain uh, the story of, uh, of the day. Um, now, in democracies and in free societies, uh, free speech is hugely important and is protected. But what we we'll all have to grapple with is how to um, confront the situation or developments uh, where actually free speech is used uh, um, as a pretext uh, to exert violence um, against the very institutions that are intended to protect the free speech of others and the uh, exercise of democratic rights. Uh, um, that's a fine line, obviously, uh, and it's something uh, where it's a situation where the democratic rights of others are severely infringed. And we'll all have to uh, confront that because what happened here can happen and did happen elsewhere too. We saw an attack on the German Reichstag back in summer um, and around 30,000 people had uh, gathered in Berlin uh, and tried to, uh, to storm uh, the Reichstag. There were very different groups. There were anti-vaxxers, there were right-wing extremists, there were left-wing extremists. It was very heterogeneous. Uh, but what was similar was uh, the determination uh, to believe in distorted facts, to present uh, uh, distorted facts, uh, to um, disseminate uh, lies uh, and to create a different universe uh, of uh, reality uh, and to, uh, to attack, uh, um, uh, to use that as uh, the grounds to attack uh, the democracy and democratic institutions. Now, what we saw on 6th uh, of November 2 uh, was how quickly words actually can be translated into action. Um, how quickly the distortion of facts uh, can be translated into violence and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and assaults, and that's something <coughs> that should uh, uh, concern us deeply too. And the next point uh, uh, would be: um, we're in this together. Today, contagion travels incredibly fast. We live in. Uh, communication society where something that happens here can have an instant replica in, in European countries or wherever in the world. And we already see uh, uh, and have seen for quite a while uh, that right wing extremist uh, 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 groups are trying to forge uh, networks. Uh, uh, we're seeing that in our countries too. So that is yet an area where uh, um, European and American trans, um, uh, uh, close cooperation uh, 
um, is very necessary and I see a, a space uh, for doing much more. Um, now to the last point you've made, or rather it was the first one you've mentioned, uh, and that is the poll you quoted. If you look at polls, uh, it's necessary also uh, to, um, to um, uh, get the context right. And I think this, the context is very early on after four years in which I think it is fair to say that the transatlantic uh, relationship uh, was um, under stress at times. Uh, I think the poll reflects a, um, a, a reaction to uh, having been thrown out of a comfort zone, if you like. It does not uh, reflect uh, uh, a lack of determination uh, to place the transatlantic relationship uh, uh, center stage because there's so many issues uh, and problems and challenges where we actually agree uh, and they are uh, far more important uh, uh, than the differences uh, where we uh, stood on different sides uh, of uh, a position uh, in the past. Uh, so don't overstate the, uh, uh, the poll. Uh, the poll is uh, an affair of the moment uh, and it reflects more uh, the experiences uh, uh, and uh, uh, looking back uh, to four years uh, of the previous administration than it does to what is possible uh, with the next administration. So Emily, I'm gonna take from that that you're optimistic that uh, looking forward, we can get through these lingering doubts about America in your country and perhaps in Europe based on last uh, month or January's uh, sixth event, but it does linger as an issue that we have to confront both in terms of the, the reality of the challenges, the concerns around social economic divide that both Europe and the United States need to work on. And in this context, you, you are quite diplomatic in talking about the strain on the transatlantic relationship. And Philippe, I'm going to put you under the gun again uh, and quote back President Macron and both you and Emily will have a chance to respond to this next question. But when Europe sets its sights on strategic autonomy in the aftermath of a challenging period in the transatlantic relationship, and Macron, President Macron describes it this way, uh, Europe has to find the ways and means to decide for itself, to rely on itself, not to depend on others, and to be able to cooperate with whomever it chooses. It sounds like there's a hedging going on. Uh, a little bit uh, in President Macron's statement and a sense of self-reliance within Europe. So what does success, what does it mean to talk about strategic autonomy? Uh, does January 6th, and I want to pick up again on that, does that reinforce European drive for that direction? Does that change the way they approach the United States and try to re-energize this uh, relationship? Or is there conflict here and if I can ask you first Philippe to respond and then Emily for you to respond to the same question. Well thank you I think it is a this uh, this issue of uh, strategic autonomy is uh, at the same time it is a debate but it's also reality and it is an experience the experience uh, of a, a world which, which has a which, which, which has been changing quite a lot. And it's a, it's a real issue um, in other terms for Europe, the European Union to be, to be more sovereign, to protect our interests or values, but also the sovereignty of our nations in the world as it is today. So it is not uh, only about the lessons we, we have learned uh, from uh, the four last years under the previous American administration. It's about the world as it is. There is a, a, a large discussion about China, for instance. There is uh, obviously issues there where we have a, a just take the screening of strategic investments. We have in, introduced reforms already to um, um, protect and to advance our sovereignty. And it is not only about security of def or defense. It's uh, it's um, it's a larger concept. Um, uh, this issue of uh, uh, what I, I would call European sovereignty and. Um, 
com coming to security and defense, it's absolutely not about uh, the EU wanting to replace NATO. On the contrary, when uh, my president, since you have quoted President Macron already a couple of times, he, he, he was very critical, not against the military organization in NATO, but against the lack of political consultation before the summit of London. And we, together with Germany, we have launched a process inside NATO to improve this, to repair this and the, the, there has been a work made by personalities of high of high level co-chaired by an American a very high level expert and, and a, a German former German minister with a French foreign minister previous foreign minister in they have come to con good conclusions and uh, so again it's absolutely not EU against NATO it's the EU, and this is the most important point for me, the European nations, the European democracies um, uh, integrated in the EU wanting to be um, stronger and to be able to, to take a, a, high, a bigger part of the burden sharing, uh, including in, in uh, issues of defense and, uh, and security, of course. But I think it's good. It's by the way, it's what the United States has been waiting from the uh, from uh, the European allies for quite a long time, and I think for good reasons. And it's what we want to do more and more. And this is for me the most important, Myron. This is really in the interest of the United States, both uh, for um, its security, because we are stronger together. If the Europeans are stronger, if the European pillar is stronger, we will be stronger together. And we need this. We have seen that before as democracies. We come back to the point of democracies needing to be to be stronger together in the world of today. So a stronger European pillar can only uh, strengthen the whole of uh, the transatlantic alliance. And it is good also, I think, uh, for uh, for the future of, uh, of this alliance and the future both of Europeans and Americans. Emily, what's the yeah. German view on this? Uh, I don't, Emily, I don't even want to put more words in your mouth. <laughs> Thanks, Myron. Um, when I sp uh, speak about um, European, or I'm asked about European sovereignty in the United States, I always sense uh, uh, that there is a misperception of what it really means. And actually, I would admit uh, that the notion of uh, European sovereignty at times is ill-defined in Europe too. Um, but what people seem to assume here, and your question framed it that way too, is that European sovereignty is a response uh, to uh, decision policies and strategies of the United States. And that's plain wrong. It's um, the um, uh, uh, European sovereignty is the conclusion uh, drawn from a massively changed ba balance in the world. And American focus will not be or less be on Europe because it's not Europe that is providing challenges to the United States today. It will be focused on other regions uh, of the world, certainly on uh, uh, China. And if the focus is moving into that direction, well, that means that uh, that Europeans will have to take decisions uh, or will have to uh, um, uh, um, generate resources in order to cover that. That's part of burden sharing. It's not a response to uh, 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 to American policies. It's a response to uh, the geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, shifts that we see, uh, and it is um, uh, it is it's making Europe more resilient and more ready to act. Uh, and that will be and I underline what. Uh, what Philippe has said, uh, that will benefit the transatlantic relationship. Frame it in the context uh, of burden sharing. Don't frame it in the world, uh, in the uh, terms of uh, um, uh, Americans and Europeans pitted against each other, because that gets it wrong. OK, we have a lot of ground still to cover. Stavos, I want to turn to you both for any quick reflections on this topic, but more uh, I want you to talk about uh, how the United States and Europe uh, can put our relationship. You, you kind of highlighted some of the areas uh, on a more solid footing, including in the area of trade. And we're going to talk about trades and what we can do in that area. But I want you to kind of help frame it. You're picking up on some comments you made earlier and reacting to what Philippe and, um, and we just uh, responded to. 
Thanks, Myron. I would say uh, on the previous question, but tying into this one, uh, strategic autonomy, um, uh, uh, there's a word that, that is missing, and we put that word, open strategic autonomy. And that's very important. Uh, fundamentally, I think we have to get back to the basics, as Philippe and uh, Emily very correctly said. Uh, in a world where revisionist powers uh, are trying to uh, change everything from the way that we trade to the way that we vote, to the way that we think, to the way that we um, you know, interact, uh, there's nothing better for the United States than a strong and independent uh, Europe. Uh, these are two allies that together can make a difference because if you look at our values, if you look at uh, human rights, if you look at uh, development data around the world and even connectivity and what we do there, uh, if you look at all those things, uh, it is only us together that can, uh, that can uh, more effectively uh, uh, promote a hopeful vision for the world and also address those who want a darker vision for the world. So that's a good thing. Now, uh, open strategic autonomy at the same time uh, is, uh, is a European aspiration. It is absolutely not autarky. <laughs> I'm getting into too many Greek words here, autonomy, autarky. But I mean, it certainly doesn't imply and never, 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 never intended uh, to have a Europe that is disconnected from the U.S. Look, look at what happened on the 6th. Uh, you know, not only did the EU not autonomize itself from the U.S., uh, you know, on the 6th of January, but you had European leaders jumped immediately into it, into the fray, um, saying that what was happening was unacceptable, that a, a free election had to be recognized. Uh, this was personal. Uh, and that kind of connection that we have, the personal connection, the values connection, the interest connection, um, always guarantees that we're going to be together. And a stronger Europe, therefore, is going to make that togetherness even stronger. Take Europe itself. Uh, we are the second biggest exporter in the world. We have 70 free trade agreements with 70 countries around the world. Um, you know, there's no interest in us to come back to the economics that is also the Chamber's major emphasis uh, in, uh, in becoming a fortress Europe. This will never happen. Um, but what we will do is that we'll make sure that we push the world, uh, whether it is in the WTO rulemaking or whether it is in bad trade actors, to, uh, to start creating a level playing field for our products, which means also for American products. Now, more broadly, Byron, I think this is one major priority. Uh, we are entirely ready to work with the United States on, uh, on looking at trade around the world. And we have proposed the Trade and Technology Council, uh, which is a wonderful way to look at the intersection between trade, technology, um, who sets the standards for artificial intelligence in the future, how do we deal with cyber security threats, uh, how do we deal with uh, and try to coordinate export controls, uh, uh, together and, uh, and foreign investment screening together. Uh, I mean, all these are areas that we are uh, ready to roll up our sleeves and run with the administration uh, to address together. So not autonomously, uh, but together. Strategic autonomy means that we will work with our allies, uh, the U.S. Uh, first and foremost, uh, whenever we can. Uh, but we're also ready to work alone when we must. When did we have to work alone in the past four years? The environment. That's another major, major priority with the next U.S. administration that I would put the emphasis on. Uh, after the U.S. withdrew from Paris and withdrew from the, from, the, uh, from the process, it was the EU that had to take fundamentally the full leadership of, of climate change on its shoulders, and it pushed the agenda forward. And now, with the administration coming back, I am supremely hopeful uh, of U.S. leadership uh, as well in this field. In practice, we need to have, when it comes to the environment, those technologies of the future that will allow our economies to grow and our people to get new jobs. We also need to make sure that that transition is fair. You asked Philippe before, and he made a very, very good point on fairness. Uh, we in Europe do not believe that this transition to, uh, to green is going to be uh, painless. It's going to be very difficult. It will require a huge investment, and it would also displace people. There are people working in coal today, including in Europe, that will lose their jobs. There are people working in producing particular kinds of en engines that may lose their jobs unless they adjust to producing other kinds of engines. So we have set up a just transition fund. We have taken from this huge fund that I told you at the beginning, and we've taken billions out of it to put in a special fund to support those people in those regions that will be transitioning. Because unless this climate transition is fair, it's not going to happen. Or if it does, it's not going to be effective. A, a third area that we wish to work on with the U.S. is the multilateral system, and let me close it with that. Um, 
virtually every topic on the agenda today, every big one, climate, trade, fighting COVID, dealing with uh, protecting democracy, uh, which is a major focus of the Biden administration of, of, of us as well, as Emily mentioned. Virtually every one of those topics is an international topic that requires an international response. We will be ready uh, in an open strategic autonomy, as I said before, to protect our own interests in all these areas if others don't play along. But we are committed to working with the leadership of the United States as well to ensure that they do, that they do play along, that we do have multilateral institutions fit for purpose, that we do reform them to ensure that they do their job taking into account new challenges. The WTO has to take into account uh, uh, has to take into account forced technology transfers. Um, but at the same time, the WTO has to be strong to do that. We need to reform it. Uh, but we cannot throw out the baby with the bathwater as we try to do so. So the appellate body, for example, I hope we can discuss effectively on how to bring it back online because, uh, you know, uh, you don't kill the umpire for uh, for applying the rules of the game as they are. You change the rules uh, if you have to. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do there as well. And finally, let me just say, Myron, we want to deal with the trade disputes with the United States and we want to do so quickly and effectively and now. Because these are irritants between the two biggest allies in the world uh, that have dragged this relationship in the past few years. They are a very small part of a hugely beneficial economic relationship for our citizens, but they've taken the, up the, the bandwidth. And we have no luxury to have that bandwidth there cluttered with that stuff. We have to, we have to deal with the other stuff. So, uh, you know, we very, very much hope that the 232 tariffs, uh, an element of, of, of perhaps uh, um, warring uh, United States strategic autonomy, uh, a decision to just declare Europe as a uh, as a, a security threat to the U.S. on steel and aluminum. We very much hope this can be lifted uh, immediately. And then we will, of course, immediately lift our own countermeasures. Uh, and that's going to be a very important boost to so many sectors in our economies, both sides. Airbus Boeing, uh, we have suggested a, uh, a freezing of the mutual tariffs on both sides for at least six months uh, to settle this dispute. It's ridiculous we're still fighting 15 years afterwards on it when we both lost our cases, but also to deal with other countries around the world, including China, that today are building 100% subsidized aircraft that could flood the market in a few years' time. And that is a real danger, uh, a real strategic danger. So we have to be strategic. We have to be smart. Um, we brought an agenda together, Ursula von der Leyen, the European, the President of the European Commission, Josep Borrell, uh, the High Representative, called the joint communication that came out in December. It is a, <laughs> actually, it's not a bad EU document. For many of you who have read many of these documents, you may go, oh my God, one more EU document. No, it is, uh, it is very focused uh, uh, in 11 pages, uh, very concrete proposals on everything that we're talking about. I encourage everyone in this room, if you haven't seen it, to download it and read it. It's a public document. Uh, and, uh, and I think if we start prioritizing uh, on both sides on these lines, we're in a good place. OK, you packed a lot in there and you cover and I agree with you, removing trade irritants in the EU relationship, including uh, with the 232 tariffs and the Boeing Airbus dispute would be a good start on the trade side. But you touched on climate and, and digitalization of the issues that are really complex. So, Philippe, I want to ask you if you want to make some additional comments on the climate agenda. Obviously, the chamber supports very much the Biden administration decision to rejoin the Paris Accords. But what does EU-US cooperation look like um, on climate? And how does that possible without China and other actors playing an equally responsible role uh, and Europe and, and Macron, again, has set very ambitious targets. And after that, I want to turn to Emily on digitalization. We'll get back to all three of you on China in more detail. Well, thank you, Myron. First, uh, I would like to reinforce to strengthen the point made by Stavros. I remember on the 1st of June um, uh, 2017, when it was announced uh, that the U.S. would uh, withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. On the same evening, uh, Emmanuel, President Emmanuel Macron from Paris launching the Make Our Planet Great Again motto. 
the Europeans have uh, kept the, the Paris Climate Agreement and we are absolutely delighted that, uh, uh, especially with uh, the, the nomination of John Kerry as Special Envoy, now the US is back in the leadership together with the European Union of this issue. And you're right to mention China and many other countries. The Paris Climate Agreement is about a path to a goal which is two or if possible one point five percent to, to limit the, the global warming um, in relation to pre-industrial levels we are not on this path we need to reinforce our efforts we need to increase our ambition and the paris climate agreement is also about this and now with this renewed american leadership we have uh, preparing for the COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, we have very, very uh, little time, but we have to increase the ambition of all countries of the whole international community. And we have, of course, to discuss with China or with India or with many other countries in the world, because everybody has, uh, and not only the EU and the United States, to increase the ambition. So we have uh, noticed what uh, the Chinese leaders and others have said, but we must now go forward and uh, this is absolutely crucial. I want to, to, to stress one point because Stavros mentioned trade very much and I completely agree with all he said about uh, solving very rapidly the disagreements we have such as Airbus Boeing or restoring the multilateral system, trade system in all its functions or developing together US, EU and other like-minded level playing field. But there is another aspect, which is the link or, um, uh, between trade and sustainable development, including um, um, not only environmental and climate provisions, but also labor. We have also to, to reach a common understanding with the new administration on this, because there is obviously a link between climate, uh, the, the protection of climate and trade. Um, this is uh, really important. But now on the climate agenda, it is not enough to, to be together to prepare the COP26. We have also to advance internally in all our countries and the EU, as uh, um, Stavros has said, has tackled both the internal policies but also the fair transition issues. I'm sure the US now will do the same. And it means also uh, not only on trade, but also on finance, of, on di disclosure uh, requirements, for instance, for our companies. I know it is a challenge for you, for the private sector, but we have, we have to work together hand in hand with the private sector. We have to make big, big efforts in research and development uh, on agriculture, on transport, on housing. We have to make progress headway in all those uh, fields together. Well, I mean, I agree with both you and Stavos that the climate is an opportunity for cooperation. But like you, Philippe, I do want to make sure that the private sector is at the table. One, because the private sector is driving innovation, but two, to ensure that the kinds of policies that are adopted don't inhibit trade, uh, to create disguised barriers to trade in the lieu of the defense of climate agenda. So it's an area that's going to require uh, a lot of engagement from the stakeholders, but also from the governments. I want to turn to Marjorie. Myron, 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 and we got together with business and we said, guys, we have to do this together. And we came up with a plan together that business could also adjust to over the years. And then we have the strategy. So it can be done. It should be done. I agree with you uh, in most cases. In some cases, you may have to move ahead uh, faster than some uh, companies uh, want to. But uh, the goal here is to ensure that everyone is on board and we harness the strength and commitment of business. Uh, business believes now that selling green is good for business. That was not the case a few years ago. I, I'm very hopeful. I, I agree with you. I think the, the, the mood of the business community has changed dramatically over the last five to 10 years because there is business opportunities uh, that will help further strengthen the resolve of governments working with the private sector to resolve what is a huge uh, challenge for us all. Marjorie, I want to turn to you, Marjorie Jorland, who runs the European program for the US Chamber. 
to ask Emily and others the next set of questions around digitalization because managing the dynamics on data privacy, on, on data flows, on data uh, digital taxes and AI and the competitive issues around cyber and other issues are going to be a tricky component of the transatlantic relationship. Marjorie? Thanks, Myron. Um, I think you set it up very well, and um, I think all three of our ambassadors have spoken, at least in, in, in reference to the digitalization agenda, uh, as being both central to our evolution uh, and our recovery, but also um, as, as areas of potential collaboration. I think there's also a question about whether this is an area of divergence. So um, Chancellor Merkel has said, for example, that Europe's competitiveness will increasingly depend on the extent to which we manage to achieve greater digital sovereignty. Um, and President Macron has said, when it comes to technology, Europe needs to build its own solutions in order not to depend on American or Chinese technologies. So as the American business community looks at it, there appears to be a form of, of techno-nationalism, or as, as it's called in Europe, tech sovereignty, uh, that appears to be cre creeping into Europe's regulation on multiple fronts. Um, and I guess the real question is, there's a growing divide, it seems, on digital policy. And I wonder to what extent that affects our ability uh, to, to confront shared challenges, for example, with respect to China's practices. Um, Emily, may I ask you to respond first? Thank you, uh, Majority. And um, I do wonder, is it really true that we are out of sync? You've quoted the Chancellor, but what she referred to uh, was the simple fact uh, that uh, Europe in technology doesn't only want to be a playground, it wants to be a player. And this is uh, um, uh, placed in the context of the experience to what extent uh, we have become uh, vulnerable in the past. Uh, so again, tech sovereignty is not about protectionism. Tech sovereignty is about resilience. Now, um, if it's true, well, last, let me quote the American president who last week spoke about uh, tech democracies and tech autocracies. And I think that's a very important way to frame it. Because if it's true uh, that the great car competition that we see nowadays is um, or has as a central feature the tech race uh, to exploit the opportunities of AI and of big data and the Internet of Things. Uh, and we don't even know what the technology is going to bring in the next uh, years. Then certainly uh, I believe that um, Americans and Europeans have a huge a fundamental and even existential interest in partnering because we agree uh, on the principles and values for our societies and for technology. And we agree uh, on standards uh, um, um, and the constraints and the limits and the scope uh, um, for the technology of the future. And we're pulling into a different direction than tech autocracies uh, do. So yeah, we do have disagreements on digital taxes and uh, on data protection uh, to some extent, uh, but to me, uh, the commonality uh, um, is, uh, is much bigger uh, than uh, the disagreement on digital taxes and uh, on data protection. And may I just remind you that a couple of years ago, when the GDPR was adopted, there was a lot of criticism in the United States. And by now, all the big tech companies in the United States have embraced it and are actually implementing it. So I believe on data protection, actually, uh, uh, not least against the backdrop of a very passionate discussion you're having in the United States with tech companies too, uh, civil society has. In Congress, uh, there is a conversation. Uh, uh, on the uh, limits and prospects. Uh, and I think we're much closer there uh, uh, than uh, some of the discussion um, uh, seems to insinuate. So to sum it up, uh, uh, technological sovereignty is not uh, about protectionism. It's about um, addressing our weaknesses and addressing our vulnerabilities, uh, addressing uh, resilience. And then I should remind everyone uh, that if um, we manage, Europeans and Americans alike, uh, to define uh, the global rules and the global standards uh, uh, for uh, technologies in the future, um, then 
we have a huge will have a huge impact on the uh, global marketplace. We won't uh, if we add Europeans and Americans in our separate uh, technological and economic universes, because we'll we will be much too small uh, uh, relatively and as uh, asymmetrically uh, in uh, response to others. So the crucial point for framing uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, digital dossiers is um, the commonality of uh, democratic interests uh, in uh, impacting on uh, uh, the future of the race uh, and the future of technology. Julie, thanks for that. I wonder, Philippe, if you would also be willing to jump in here. I think one of the biggest concerns that, that we have, of course, is that as Europe strives for uh, tech sovereignty, um, as, as Emily has described it as being about resilience, it appears that some of what Europe is trying to do is to build its own resilience and its own competitiveness, but at the expense of, of American companies. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, uh, and then we can sort of segue into the conversation again, a topic I think you've all touched on, uh, which is the competition vis-a-vis -vis China. Billy? Well, Marjorie, I think, and I, I, I fully subscribe to, to what Emily said, that uh, digital sovereignty is a part of this uh, uh, debate and uh, uh, goals uh, we, we share on uh, European sovereignty. But in the same terms, as we described, it is not against the United States. And uh, just let's take the example of tax, digital tax, where my country is uh, in particular um, uh, on the forefront, so to say, because we have alre already uh, uh, adopted such a, a national tax. Again, we see, as Emily has rightly said, a convergence between uh, the United States and uh, the European Union on the debate on the fairness of tax systems and on the fact that the tax systems are not anymore adapted uh, to the digital economy. I think that nobody disagrees with that. And we all agree that we need to find a multilateral rule. We, we, we need and, and for this, fortunately enough, we have a, a, a forum, which is the OECD, which has uh, developed this um, uh, negotiation for a, a, an international rules, uh, uh, taking into account the adaptation of uh, tax uh, models to, to the digital economy. So uh, it's up uh, and we are, fa I'm fairly uh, hopeful that with uh, the, the new administration wanting to come back to more multilateral uh, negotiating frameworks and 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 and, and uh, institutions, and uh, we we want all to to find a, 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 a solution. So I don't think that there is a diverge a divergence on the goals. On the contrary, um, fair taxation, privacy, uh, respect of privacy. Um, also, uh, resilience uh, and uh, cyber security, everything, and I could quote many other examples, I think we share the same goals. Now, the way we implement it, of course, um, uh, is uh, very important. And to come to cyber security after the solar winds uh, issue and many other developments also in our countries, frankly, we have here a huge, a huge common goal. And I, I would really advise uh, all of us also to work together. Uh, um, now we, we can, uh, as I said, work more in a multilateral way. Uh, we have this, uh, for instance, so-called Paris call for trust and and uh, and security in cy cyberspace, which was adopted not only by many governments, but also by many companies where some big US tech companies played a very important role. Let's let's work to develop these uh, multilateral and multi stakeholders initiatives um, by multi stakeholders. I mean, not only governance, but also with the with the with the economy, with the business. So we are we are we are cooperating with uh, the companies, uh, including the, the US companies. I see Marjorie where you say that the US companies feel targeted because they are they are dominant on this market, of course, but it's not about that for us. We want to to regulate properly uh, and also to foster innovation, to continue to foster innovation. But we want to, to reach our policy goals, which are more and more important. I, I think that they are more and more similar on both sides of the Atlantic. So let's cooperate. OK, there's a lot there's a lot there. We uh, 
we don't have time to cover everything, but I want to make sure we spend a little time on China, a little bit more depth, and on Russia, and possibly on on the recent Brexit deal if we have time before I have a sum up question for each of you. Stavos, uh, just in the interest of time, if you could be brief on this. China is clearly um, an area that has been more contentious between the United States uh, and China. We've seen it on trade, human rights issues. We've seen it around South China Seas. We've seen it around Hong Kong, Uyghur issues. There's a range of issues. But on the trade agenda, where both Europe and the United States have talked about closer cooperation and dealing with both uh, how to engage China and other countries in the multilateral system so we share responsibility, but also uh, how to put, uh, let's be frank, a little bit more pressure on China on structural reforms in areas like intellectual property uh, and its subsidies practices in reforming its state sector. Uh, recently, uh, Europe concluded uh, the framework of a uh, investment deal with China uh, that some would argue leverages off the phase one deal with the United States. That probably is not your view, but that is some people's views. And I wonder how you see that dynamic uh, engaged uh, engaged in your own interest with China. How does that how does that foster cooperation between the United States and Europe in dealing with the trade and technology challenges? that we need to confront with China, hopefully uh, in a way that reinforces the role that China wants to play in the global community, but also uh, sets out very clear uh, guidelines and perimeters for how Europe and the United States will engage a rising power in the world today that is arguably going to be the largest economy within a decade, and by most uh, accounts in Europe, is going to be the most important uh, economic player on the world stage very soon. So, Stavos, your thoughts? Thanks, Myron. Um, very quickly on China. Uh, the US and the EU uh, share absolutely the analysis of the problems that China poses, whether it is uh, human rights and repression of democracy internally, whether it is its efforts to export those bad governance practices to other countries more aggressively than before, together with uh, heavily subsidized goods, whether it is a domestic uh, Chinese economy uh, that has a huge government front bit uh, on it, creating uh, a, a non-level playing field, uh, whether it is uh, Hong Kong and Xinjiang, whether it is uh, its aggression towards its neighbors. Uh, so uh, the question is, how do you best address and deal with China on these issues? Um, when it comes especially to the economic issues, I'll say the following, Myron. Um, we, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about decoupling from China, including in this country, and and I think the Chamber of Commerce uh, has, uh, in its own analysis, concluded that uh, that whether or not decoupling is a smart thing to do, uh, it is not a, a thing that can be done. We our economies are way too integrated. Um, maybe it can be done in some areas, uh, but but not the general uh, slogan of decoupling. So, what do you do if you're Europe and the United States? I would suggest to you you do two things. The first thing you do is you run faster than China. That means that you provide the incentives and capabilities for investment on all the critical new technologies that will make Europe and the United States traditionally, historically, the biggest innovation hubs in the world, leaders ahead of China. So that China, with all its subsidization, cannot continue uh, threatening that leadership. The second thing you got to do is you have to protect the runners. In other words, you have to have the rules in place to ensure that the intellectual property thefts, all these other things that uh, risk uh, the advantage that we get through, through that major investment in running faster uh, to be taken away. You have those rules in place to stop it. And these are trade rules, trade defense rules, WTO rules. So in a nutshell, that's what you have to do. We have to work together on digital technology uh, and setting the standards of the future, as both Emily and, uh, and Philippe have said. This is not uh, Kumbaya, this is the biggest challenge we have. Um, artificial intelligence will govern our, align, uh, our lives for, uh, for decades, centuries. Uh, we cannot allow uh, the, uh, the ways that, uh, that cameras are being used in Xinjiang uh, to monitor and repress people to become the new normal of, of the way you use those things. Little parentheses, how complex that gets. Look at dual technologies uh, when we're talking about, uh, about export controls. 
you know, dual technology in the past were, was an easy thing, right? You had a, let's say, a rocket. Okay, it's obvious it can be used for dual purposes. But what happens when your refrigerator becomes a dual, dual technology uh, tool where you can look at uh, your habits, what you put in, when you take out and determine things about you. Uh, these are difficult issues and we have to deal with them together. Now, finally, the CHI that you mentioned, the, the agreement of investment. Uh, Myron, this is something that has been negotiated for seven years. Uh, and uh, back in 2019, uh, we said that uh, we were about to conclude it. It had nothing to do, of course, with the uh, US domestic, domestic political process. It's a very uh, targeted uh, agreement. It intends to protect European companies already investing in China and those who want to go in there uh, in the future from all the distortions of the investment market in China that we see today. It tries to do so by doing three things, creating more market access, uh, creating a, um, a level playing field when it comes to transparency for Chinese subsidies, state-owned enterprises, etc., and third, for the first time, it leverages a major economic power's weight to try to ensure sustainable development when it comes to the environment and when it comes to labor rights. Now, um, and I, I emphasize the first time because, of course, this is not a silver bullet and investment agreement cannot resolve all. But in our view, this is precisely the kind of instrument that, can, that opens now the door for strong EU-US cooperation. So if you look at the level playing field provisions that we have achieved, with China when it comes to subsidies and other stuff like that. This is a unique platform for the US and the EU now to talk together about how we push forward whatever we achieved and stuff we didn't at the WTO and at the plurilateral level. When you look at the market opening in services, that is most favored nation. Every US company, uh, any other company around the world uh, that is interested to invest in those areas that China up to now uh, had uh, unfair uh, blockages in its market, uh, can benefit from what we achieve. So I am optimistic that what we are doing with China, a determination not to allow China anymore uh, to use its unfair trade uh, practices against us and against our open and free economies. The toolboxes that we keep in Europe entirely unaffected by the CHI, the 5G tool toolbox to deal with risks of 5G technology and investment, the investment screening toolbox that we have in place, uh, the uh, instruments we're developing now for public procurement, not to allow uh, subsidized companies to be um, attacking and taking uh, procurements in, our, in free open markets. All those things remain in place. All those things are uh, out there to work together with the US. And again, the Trade and Technology Council that I mentioned, uh, but also a EU-US-China dialogue that we have proposed this could be remarkable uh, platforms to work together, also incorporating business views. Okay, so Stavos, in sum, you see a convergence of our agendas and you see opportunity for us to work effectively together, not just on China, but through the multilateral system to deal with some of the underlying tensions and issues. Uh, second, you just previewed our decoupling report. Yes, I do. Thank yes, you. Yes. It's not due to come out for another week, but uh, the chamber will have a report on on the issue of decoupling, which has been a centerpiece of discussions on the United States China front, particularly on the technology front. Uh, I want to turn to you, Emily, next, uh, and then I'll turn to Philippe on on Iran. But I want to talk to you about Russia. Obviously, Chancellor Merkel has had such an enormous role in in looking at the um, relationship between Europe and Russia. Russia sits on your on your border. Uh, Russia doesn't have the economic might of China, but Russia has nevertheless uh, uh, confronted uh, NATO and uh, Europe and the United States with a series of challenges. Real quickly, what uh, what should be the approach to Russia in this next chapter uh, with Europe and, of course, in the transatlantic space? Well, um, Russia, as you indicated, is a very difficult and very complex uh, uh, partner. Uh, how difficult and how complex you can see uh, in the story of uh, uh, the uh, uh, attempted Navalny murder, uh, the Tiergarten murder, the Salisbury uh, uh, story, the uh, Crimea uh, annexation uh, catch, uh, the undeclared uh, uh, war in Eastern Ukraine and so forth. Um, 
But it's also true uh, that we will be needing Russia on a number of issues. Uh, this morning we heard uh, that new st uh, start had been finalized uh, and uh, adopted in the uh, Russian parliament. So uh, uh, it's an example of uh, um, uh, um, global issue in this, uh, in this uh, uh, context disarmament uh, where you actually need to engage Russia. And that's true for governance issues too. And that's true for regional issues, even if Russia is at uh, the core and the root uh, of the conflict, say uh, um, in Ukraine or in uh, Syria and so forth. So it's just a fact that uh, international uh, relations cannot only be about rewarding or sanctioning behavior. Uh, we actually have to address uh, issues, challenges and problems and some will be needing Russia. Um, a second uh, uh, point and a very important one is one of the strategic objectives of Russia, uh, and, uh, not least given uh, the lack of economic uh, might, it has returned as a military superpower, but it has, or a military power, but it has, it is not an economic or technological uh, power, but it compensates uh, as that uh, uh, by disruptive policies uh, and by undermining uh, um, European and transatlantic uh, cohesion. Now, we have difficult discussions and conversations about Russia in uh, in Europe because we come from different vantage points. We have different size, power, experiences, uh, vulnerabilities, and that's true for the transatlantic relationship too. But it seems to me that it is crucial uh, that we overcome uh, uh, the differences uh, that sometimes we factor in uh, interests not our, um, not our own in order to be able to present to Russia a united front because Russia's capacity uh, um, uh, to um, uh, uh, um, Russia's capacity to pursue its own policies against uh, Europe or in Europe or with regard to the United States or across, uh, in regional conflicts to um, considerable, considerable extent depends uh, uh, on uh, undermining uh, European uh, and transatlantic unity uh, on using the uh, fissures uh, that it analyzes uh, and exploiting them and we need to uh, we need to uh, uh, put a barrier to, uh, uh, to that so uh, my uh, conclusion is while we may have differences uh, again uh, the necessity to concentrate uh, on the commonalities of views of views is strategically and politically of overwhelming importance there's a lot there, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move to Philippe and cover one last country really quickly so we can wrap up with uh, Philippe. Uh, Iran is an area where obviously the Trump administration pulled out of the JCPOA. It caused some uh, conflict or strain in the transatlantic relationship. France has been at the center of this uh, issue. I think we can all agree that uh, uh, a common approach to Iran is needed, not just to deal with it, uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions, but also, frankly, the destabilizing factor that that country has played in the region. Quickly, your thoughts on, on next steps here uh, in the transatlantic relationship. Well, there's a lot in the inbox. But thank you. At some thank point, you, they're going to get to this issue too. <laughs> Anyway, I have to be quick because I have to leave you. Uh, unfortunately, I have another commitment. And uh, so it is not a problem to be quick because it is such a simple issue, isn't it? <laughs> no, but uh, to be serious, uh, obviously, um, it will be one of the most um, important and uh, probably uh, quite quickly uh, issues we have to 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 work on with uh, the new administration and we look forward to it but uh, you know our position we we have always won the, the GCPOA had a, a very uh, a very simple goal and um, in the field of nuclear non-proliferation uh, which is that uh, Iran never be able, is able to acquire uh, military and nuclear capacities and we this we must keep this in mind and we want uh, uh, of course to to take into account the reality of today which is that uh, after we, the American withdrawal from the GCPOA Iran is more and more diverged from compliance with the GCPOA and it becomes more and more dangerous so there is both a, a new urgency uh, in 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 coming back um, um, uh, on the Iran side with the, the compliance with the GCPOA, but we, are, we have also to address, as you said, Myron, the other issues and uh, 
of course we have also and we have always been uh, my president in particular uh, recognizing that there are other issues to address which are um, as in, in particular the, the, the ballistic uh, proliferation issue but also the regional uh, uh, situation and the, the security in the region so we 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 I think we agree with the new administration uh, basically on, on what we have to do which which doesn't mean it is easy and, um, and 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 we look forward to working uh, uh, very rapidly with the new administration on this as E3 because it's uh, the format we have uh, been doing um, um, we have been following on this uh, together with Germany and the United Kingdom and the role of the European Union as such uh, which is important as you know is in, is in the GCPOA together with the two other signatories which are Russia and, and China. So, Philip, your last sentence uh, is what on the state of the relationship going forward, the transatlantic relationship? Give us one sum up sentence and then I'll turn to Emily and Stavos for their sum up. Where well, are we today? Where will we be in the next year? I think we have a plenty of reasons to uh, to 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 work on a very uh, substantial and a, a very positive uh, transatlantic agenda and maybe one of the most important reasons is uh, that we will be able to work together again with the united states inside the international system in as democracies as uh, also responsible partners in the international community to work again inside the international uh, multilateral system to improve it, uh, be it the WHO, the WTO, or any other uh, part of the international system. We are again together, the United States and the European Union, to work within the system to improve it in our interest and in the interest of our values, the values we share. Thank Emily, you very much. Your concluding sentence? Um, um, we will have relaunched the transatlantic relationship not in the sense of having returned uh, to uh, um, uh, an earlier um, uh, administration, but in the sense of a new response uh, uh, to the problems and challenges uh, that have evolved over time and confront us today, but uh, um, reaffirming and committed to reaffirming and committed to uh, uh, the primacy uh, of uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, and uh, unity. Great. Stavos? Myron, I, you cannot defy gravity. Uh, the EU and the US are drawn together by uh, common values. Um, we build the multilateral world on the on We're having a we little bit of a back. Okay, good. good. We, we're, we're drawn together by values, we're drawn together by history, we've had each other's back uh, for, uh, for decades and we will continue to. We're drawn together by human relations, um, all those uh, Europeans who've come and helped build this country and Americans who've uh, come and prospered in Europe. Um, I have no doubt uh, that uh, it's not going to be a, a rose a pedaled road ahead, there obviously will be uh, issues of disagreement. But whereas those disagreements in the past have, uh, have grabbed the headlines, uh, they will leave those headlines. I am committed to that and all of us in this call are. Um, and we will focus on the areas where joint values, are joint interest, and frankly, a joint uh, gravitational weight in the world can provide leadership uh, to where it's most needed. Climate, trade, um, uh, digital, uh, fighting the vaccine and not having another such catastrophe again uh, will be in the front lines, Americans and Europeans, and therefore it's going to be uh, okay. And we will work with others. It's not just this versus anything else. We'll work with China on climate. We have to. It's the biggest polluter today. It's made commitments. We'll have to do that. We'll work with so many other countries on democracy. We have to do that. Countries around the world, many of them are sitting on the fence, not because they hate democracy or they don't like human rights. It's because their history, their own development have brought them there. They have to fall on the right side of the fence. We have to work with them and support them. So this is a hopeful, difficult time, but it's going to be okay. 
So let me uh, end on optimistic note. I think what you heard today from three diplomats from Germany, France, and the EU is a sense that we have a huge complex agenda before us, uh, but there is some energy and a revitalization of the transatlantic relationship and an opportunity uh, to work together on the major challenges that Stavos and Emily and Philippe outlined here today. It won't come easy. Uh, there'll be roadblocks in the way. It also has to be a shared one, not just between Europe and the United States, but with China, India, and major actors around the world. But clearly, uh, if we're going to face and confront the challenges that we have with the pandemic, with climate, with many other areas, including trade, we're going to be better off if Europe and the United States are strong partners aligned with our values, our sense of history, and our sense of mission, uh, and I think it can be accomplished uh, in the year ahead and years ahead, but it won't come easy and there's a lot of work. Thank you again for joining this on record session of INSTEP. I have been uh, in, really excited by the content today. There's a lot to chew over uh, from the three ambassadors. Uh, Marjorie and I, thank you all for participating here. Thank you for your questions and we very much encourage you uh, to give us your input about this forum and about future forums. We'll have more to say on the next series uh, of forums in the next uh, couple of weeks, but thank you again for joining us here today. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you both. Thanks, Myron.